I'm just trying to figure out if I can recognize any of the buildings. Is that is yeah. that a is it a Hong Kong shot or is it? Um... You know, that's a good uh, good question. I actually our team put this together. I just love the visual, but I, I guess yeah, I, I didn't. Right. I should I should ask the question. It, it doesn't look like Hong Kong though. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just love the visual. <laughs> Yeah, you got a point. I, I can't recognize this place. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I, won't, I, won't tell, I won't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, a, that's our best kept secret. No one asked this question. We've been using this slide, slide for at least six months. You're the first one. To, uh, you got a good eye for, for details, John. Yeah. <laughs> I think just for, for everybody that's just joined, we're just waiting a couple more minutes for a few extra people to um, uh, to dial in and be admitted to the meeting, um, and then we'll we'll be getting underway. Um, so please don't think that there's something going wrong just because we're all being quiet. <laughs> Great. Well, perhaps uh, so, John. Perhaps we and uh, the other guests. Perhaps we'll start in two minutes so that at least for those who are online, they don't have to wait for too long. We we'll just keep, keep rolling. Sure, sounds good. All right. <laughs> okay, so I guess uh, we are on. So the, hello everyone, uh, good morning and good afternoon. So thanks for uh, joining us at this uh, Digital Assets uh, Roundtable. Again, I cannot ask for a better panel than we have today. So we have uh, Lucy Gasmarium, I hope that I pronounce it properly, from uh, uh, Token Bay Capital representing the investment uh, side. And then we have uh, John Routes with uh, Digital Assets, uh, who is the expert on the, the blockchain infrastructure 
technology experts. And then we also have a Matt Long, uh, who is with uh, OSL, the only licensed uh, digital asset trading platform uh, in Hong Kong by the SFC. So again, this basically represents a very nice mix of expertise from investment to the technology use cases to also operating an exchange platform, also providing the services uh, to the uh, professional investors. Now, so with, with that, I just want to perhaps uh, set a scene in terms of uh, how we're going to spend the next uh, hour. So essentially, we would like to start off with uh, sharing with you about uh, a quick snapshot about the landscape uh, in Hong Kong and what makes uh, you know, Hong Kong interesting as a market for digital assets uh, players like yourself. Now, at the same time, we would like to, I guess, use that to tee off a, a brief discussion uh, with our three distinguished guests and speakers so that we're able to, in a way, tee up a few topics so that hopefully those uh, discussions can stimulate uh, some more uh, think thinking and questions from you. And, and really, I think the event today is about uh, you uh, helping you understand better about the, the Hong Kong landscape. At the same time, we also would like, for example, like Lucy as an investor to get understand better about you know, the firms uh, that uh, you represent so that hopefully we can have some kind of uh, exchange that lead up to some business opportunities. So without further ado, perhaps I'll just quickly give you a, a quick snapshot about the Hong Kong uh, FinTech landscape. Now, a good way to start uh, looking at Hong Kong is that um, now given the International Financial Center uh, status, we are actually quite rich as a B2B environment. Uh, as you can see from uh, this slide, uh, based on number of uh, advice that we have across the different segments, you know, from asset management, to banking, insurance, uh, and so forth. So if you are basically providing you know, B2B fintechs, you know, like blockchain solutions, and so on, there's a pretty good you know, size of market for you to, to access. So this is the so B2B story. Now, at the same time, when we look at uh, the developments of uh, the Hong Kong landscape so far in, in recent years, it's a pretty healthy mix of uh, distribution of uh, fintech firms, you know, from the red tech space, and then like 23%, you know, the digital assets, wealth tech. Yeah, you know, these are the ones that have been getting a lot of traction in the recent years. So definitely today we would like to focus a bit more on the digital assets uh, discussion. Now, at the same time, the many folks uh, from uh, overseas markets they often would like to know the investment landscape. So, is there the money? Uh, to be raised? Uh, and the answer is absolutely yes. When you look at uh, the slide here, Hong Kong actually represents the second largest uh, private capital pool uh, in Asia, uh, just behind mainland China. So it's, it's a pretty enormous pool of uh, US dollar, 170 billion. Now, of course, I think the, uh, the stock market is also very vibrant uh, in terms of IPOs. Now, I think the other thing that uh, captured a lot of uh, media attention in recent years is the an enormous uh, wealth management market. So they are, in short, there are a lot of wealthy people uh, in Hong Kong, as you can see from this slide. At the, at the same time, we also other figures that indicate an equally uh, impressive uh, landscape for the uh, GBA market, which is uh, where Hong Kong is part of. Now, um, the other aspect about the sort of wealth effects, if you will, uh, in the GBA and Hong Kong is uh, you can judge it based on the action taken by the major uh, financial uh, institutions, such as the Citibank, the Senate Charter, HSBC, all of them have been really ramping up the hiring to in a way to basically catch you know, this uh, enormous wave of wealth being unleashed uh, as the GBA opened up, opened up more. Now, um, the other aspect that might be of interest to you is that the uh, US Hong Kong has been uh, pretty active uh, in recent months in ramping up our family office team, that we have a dedicated team of colleagues that are reaching out to family offices around the world to invite them to set up in Hong Kong. And part of that is supported by another, I would say, policy uh, measure. That is the uh, new limited partnership fund regime. So in essence, it is a regime that allows the funds, now VC and PE funds, to more easily sell in Hong Kong and uh, together with uh, very attractive uh, test concessions making Hong Kong on par you know, with the, uh, the Caymans and you know, the, the BVIs alike. So since the launch of this program, the, uh, the LPF, we have uh, over 300 funds set up, so merely in the past few months, 
uh, since this uh, re re regime uh, has launched, which is pretty impressive. Now, we also have a pretty, um, I guess, a good collection of programs to do business matching. So essentially, uh, firms from overseas, they're able to come in Hong Kong at any given time during the year. Chances are there will be a program of business matching to pair you up with the uh, corresponding uh, F5 uh, target clients you know, from the banks, the asset managers, the insurance companies, and so on. Now, so this is just a quick snapshot of some of the corporate champions that we have. And as you can see, you know, this represents a pretty uh, good spectrum of uh, payment companies, the banks, the uh, asset managers, um, you know, wealth managers, insurance guys, and so forth. So that is a good way to basically shorten the time, particularly if you're B2B. So we can basically get you sorted out uh, pretty quickly with these target, target audience and clients. At the same time, we have uh, a, a good collection of uh, investors uh, such as uh, Lucy's firm that specializes in uh, you know, uh, digital assets. We also have other investors that have been investing in FinTech, but then they do have uh, different geographic uh, uh, strengths in terms of having uh, the great connections in, in China, such as City Capital. We have other you know, family offices that are quite strong in ASEAN countries and so on. Now, so I think I, I won't go into a lot of details because today is really about you know, getting um, our three uh, distinguished uh, speakers to share their experience uh, with all of you so that you get a better sense about uh, the, the Hong Kong uh, markets. So with that, perhaps, I'll just uh, start with the money. So let's let's start with Lucy. So obviously you've been you know holding the uh, the first string, you know, throwing out the, the the funding to different uh, firms that you come across. So can you just uh, briefly describe what you've been seeing uh, in you know, recent months in terms of what are the interesting projects that have been uh, receiving funding and attention from uh, various peers of yours? Yeah, I mean, after that presentation, if I wasn't sold on Hong Kong already, I certainly would be. So uh, that was that was pretty compelling. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'm my my fund is an early stage uh, venture fund, so it's looking at sort of new new companies building in the digital assets and blockchain space. Um, you know, I mean, to lead on from that pie chart where digital assets is the twelve percent. Um, you know, I think digital assets, which is obviously a very all encompassing term. You know, it's virtual assets is, has a lot of uh, different meanings, right? And there are lots of different approaches. But Hong Kong is really on fire. And actually, in terms of, you know, the beginning of digital assets, which we used to call crypto, depending on, you know, what, what your inclination is, you know, Hong Kong was, is a hotbed for crypto companies for this kind of type of technology. Um, I think what's interesting now is we're seeing traditional financial services really embracing the promise of this technology. And that's where so much excitement is happening as sort of CFI meets DeFi, if you like. Um, and Hong Kong, because it's an international finance hub, is so well positioned to sort of, um, you know, create sort of a, a fertile environment for lots of startups. You know, I'll say one thing about Hong Kong, and I was actually born in Hong Kong and, and I grew up here, is it's, it's a village, right? It's, um, you know, which is good in many respects, maybe for your personal life, not so good, but for, for a business perspective, incredible networking. I really personally feel it's unrivaled and it's so international as well as a, as a networking village. And that's what you need when you're a startup, you know, you need to be networking, you need to understand um, what's going on, who's doing what, what are the different projects, accelerators, who to speak to. And, you know, those types of in introductions and, and, and meetings are, are really easy in Hong Kong. Um, so, so I'm seeing incredible opportunities in the financial services space as it comes to digital assets and blockchain. Um, you know, whether you're looking at the new digital asset custodians or some of the blockchain forensics companies, um, my fund also does invest in tokens, so we can come on to discuss actual virtual assets themselves. Um, and, you know, some really interesting DeFi, DeFi tokens that I'm investing in as well. So, um, I mean, I could keep talking for, for the whole hour, so I'll stop there. But, uh, you know, in short, uh, Hong Kong's an incredible place. It's really thriving ecosystem over here. Great. Uh, thank you, Lucy, for teeing this up. And perhaps I guess I can lead on from your uh, comments about the, the blockchain, the infrastructure technology aspects by inviting John to say a few words about what's your observation based on your dealing with your clients. So, so where are the opportunities 
for the infrastructure blockchain players. Excellent, thank you, King. Um, uh, I suppose for for our company, we we uh, work with traditional financial institutions around the world, but uh, in Asia, we've been based in Hong Kong because we've got a very strong partnership with the Hong Kong Exchange. Um, for those that uh, I suppose just to add on to Lucy's point about Hong Kong is the place to be, uh, the Hong Kong Exchange is the largest market infrastructure group in the world, um, and that has some very important implications. All of the biggest investors are here, all of the biggest broker dealers are here, all of the biggest custodians are here. And when you think about um, uh, blockchain technology, smart contract technology, as it's applied to um, the core plumbing of the financial system, um, there's no better place to be than the connecting pot uh, or the melting pot that is that is Hong Kong. I think the, the exchange for a long time has positioned itself as the... Um, the connection between China and the world and the bringing together of those two ecosystems, those two pools, um, creates immense opportunity. I also think um, sort of here in Hong Kong and more broadly across Asia, there is great appetite to leapfrog uh, in terms of financial technologies. Um, there's been a slow and steady standardization um, that's crept across Europe and the Americas um, around uh, previous generation technologies focused in on messaging, uh, messaging type interactions between firms. Um, but there's real appetite and momentum in Asia um, being led by people like the Hong Kong Exchange and, and uh, HSBC here uh, to, to start to apply this technology to core business processes across their capital markets operations and also their trade operations. Um, and so uh, I suppose from a... From a business perspective, if you're um, <clears throat> if you're looking at the the blockchain space, it, there's a number of different areas of opportunity. If you're a service provider to existing companies, there's a wealth of opportunity. And as Lucy said, um, going after completely new areas of of opportunity um, in the public blockchain space is also um, uh, a big pool of uh, I suppose people have gravitated to Hong Kong uh, and that op optionality doesn't exist in many jurisdictions. So just seconding what, what Lucy had said, uh, irrespective of which way you, um, uh, you lean, there is great opportunity here in Hong Kong. Great, uh, thank you, John. I'm sure that our audience would probably come back <laughs> with more questions to, uh, to, to basically get a better view about how you pitch the clients and, and the, the selling cycle and all those uh, great uh, questions. Uh, but I, I guess I would like to quickly change gear, uh, that Matt, um, because I, I think that you guys have been uh, really patiently working with the regulators uh, for a good number of years to really have to also educate the regulator about the, the way to sort of structure the, the regulation. And then now you are the one flying the black, you know, being the first and only one that can uh, operate as a digital as, as, asset uh, trading, tra uh, trading exchange platform. Now, so can you really share with the audience about, so now that you are in, in operation, I understand you guys are looking at the, the secure tokens and the different aspects of a uh, so, you know, way of offering a different look, right, for the, uh, the professional investors. So can you share a little bit about what opportunities do you see so far? Yeah, yeah, sure, King. Thank you for the, uh, for the question. Um, yeah, firstly, delighted to, to be here. Um, you know, Hong Kong's Hong Kong's our our home base. We're um, you know, we're, we're listed on the exchange in uh, in Hong Kong. Eight six three is our, our share code. Um, we know well the the capital markets by virtue of that. Um, and we obviously, as you as you mentioned, the regulatory environment as it relates to digital assets. Um, you know, we'd like to think that we uh we have a pretty good understanding of of the evolution of that. We, as you say, are the you know we are the only uh, regulated digital asset firm in, in Hong Kong. Um, you know, our, it, it's very, very clear to us that the, the uh, you know, we, we, we have a global business, so we have a, a fairly good read on the, the state of regulation globally. And what, um, what's really clear is that the, um, the Securities and Futures Commission in Hong Kong has uh, implemented a framework which is, is, is really, really unique. Uh, and, and that's for a couple of reasons. I think you know, number one, the the level of investor protection that is that it's provided under the uh, under the under the regulatory framework is uh, is of ex, of an extremely high level. Um, it's on the equivalent of um, sort of securities securities regulation. And in fact, we are 
our licensing is we are regulated under the same um, the same or the auspices of the same sort of um, act that the um, uh, ordinance that the uh, that securities firms are. So very very high bar when it comes to investor protection. Um, the way that the regulators require us to offer digital asset custody as well, you know, we we argue that that uh, that makes us one of the safest custodians in the world, and for a couple of different reasons, and I can go into that in more detail later. Um, the, the there's I guess there's a, a broader point as well, and this sort of I think this comes back to the one of the points that both you know both Lucy and John made is that doing doing business in Hong Kong's pretty. Uh, it's difficult everywhere, but in Hong Kong, it's pretty easy, right? People, people are open to having conversations. Um, people, people want to do business. You know, Hong Kong's a, a trading center that's built on people who want to build businesses and entrepreneurs. And, you know, it's, you, you don't need a, an old boy, old girl network to be successful. Um, and so it's really, it means that you can, you can actually get in. And that means for new businesses like digital asset businesses, which need to go and, and tell their story, um, there's you, you get it you get an open door people want to learn how they can make money people want to know how that they can actually grow with you and uh you know it's um you know it's it's what you know it's one of the reasons why it's our home it's why we're in you know we're, we're listed here um you know it's a, it's a and, and that's sort of without sort of moving moving to you know look at the, the the next 10 or 15 years and the whole greater bay you know sort of narrative <clears throat> Great. Uh, I guess I can't agree more, uh, Matt. In fact, I think the digital assets uh, market in uh, Hong Kong have been doing so well organically. So I guess I guess I, at the government's uh, uh, side that uh, we can't claim much credit because basically the, the whole market just thrived on its own. And in fact, uh, it was just uh, probably like six months ago that I came across uh, some folks that I used to know and uh, re I recently joined uh, Goldman. And uh, I just kind of stumble on the fact that they got a pretty uh, good good sized team uh, looking at digital assets based in Hong Kong. It's actually the largest uh, uh, headcounts uh, among all, all offices of uh, Gold Goldman uh, based in Hong Kong, just looking at investments and different kind of use cases, which is something that I did not expect. Now, so I guess perhaps again, just to have more context for audience, maybe I'll go in one more round uh, with uh, Lucy, John and Matt, and then we can perhaps open up uh, for some interaction with our guests. And so with that, perhaps I'll uh, come back to Lucy. So obviously you are like in the news, they are being interviewed and like, everywhere uh, all the time. Now, um, I guess one thing that in a way I would like to sort of relate back to sort of the security tokens, you know, asset back, donization aspects. So uh, one of the things that you see that have gained the most traction, is it arts, is it the NFTs, is it the, the real estate, organization. So what is it that they have seen so far? Um, so I would say with digital assets, what makes it so exciting is that there are sort of six months waves. You know, there's a new there's a new trend. You know, we talk about the DeFi summer. We talk about the NFT, you know, kickoff in 2021. You know, who, who knows what's coming into play for the last quarter of, uh, of the year, which is phenomenal, right? Because people, the, these trends are happening. It is such an explosive area of uh, innovation and technology and creativity. Um, you know, that, that we don't really know what's going to take off. I think when this whole um, blockchain and digital assets first started, there was great hope for um, tokenizing illiquid um, assets like real estate. But actually what it's turned out to, to is that the less regulated um, sectors um, are actually, you know, creativity can be unleashed and so, you know, we've seen that demonstrated in the NFT space. Um, and we have a unicorn, which is Animoca Brands, right here in Hong Kong, in Cyberport. Um, and we're seeing incredible um, innovation when it comes to NFTs and gaming in the metaverse. Um, arguably, we're also going to see the financialization of NFTs, right? So NFTs are actually going to become a part of the financial services landscape. Um, so, you know, in short, it's sort of tumbling, tumbling trends in the space. Um, and at the moment, it looks like um, NFTs are very hot in Hong Kong. We've got the digital art fair coming up next year, uh, next month, um, where NFT art is being displayed. I think uh, Hong Kong has always been a hot hub for art. So this is really captured sort of finally digital assets is, is being recognized by very traditional um, sectors of society, if you like, um, because suddenly NFT art is, is very hot. Um, 
you know, we've got Christie's coming and doing their first uh, auction for NFTs, CryptoPunks next month and Asia, they've chosen Hong Kong in Asia. So, um, you know, this is all digital assets and um, it, it's all happening. And I think, you know, Hong Kong, where it's been very steady and very early to the game has been in security tokens. Um, and as John said, you know, Chi Hong Kong is a gateway to China's opening up of their capital markets and the rest of the world's capital markets. And migrating all assets onto a blockchain just makes sense because it's a better foundational um, layer. Um, and Hong Kong's very well positioned to do that. I would say that one of the missing pieces is CBDCs. And we're also in the part of the world where our fiat currency is moving onto a uh, blockchain DLT type infrastructure very fast. So, you know, that for me bodes very well for Hong Kong's position as a security token um, hub, because we're going to have fiat currency uh, um, on a blockchain as well. And actually, I think it was just reported yesterday, the digital yuan, which is been a retail play up until this point, certainly with, you know, um, experimenting with the airdrops in China. Now they're looking for uh, Chinese to be able to access financial products and services using the digital yuan. So it's moving into institutional um, hands. So, you know, it's all coming together in a really interesting way. Um, the lines are blurring and there's a new trend every month. Maybe it's metaverse, metaverse for the last quarter of, uh, of the year. <clears throat> Well, speaking of metaverse, I uh, somehow <laughs> dropped this word with my kids. Uh, I got a son, 17 year old, my daughter, 15 year old. Supposedly all this new stuff, they're much more advanced than I do. So for a change, when I mentioned this word, this is the first time for, for a long while that, that they didn't understand what I'm talking about, which I felt so good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, I guess uh, I would like to uh, go back to John. I believe uh, in our last conversation, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, we had a, a brief chat about the BSN, you know, the blockchain service network, you know, I don't know, and the role of Hong Kong being at the international node that kind of like extend out to the other sort of international chains and then help to sort of like uh, facilitate the interoperability. So uh, can, can you share a little bit about the observation? So obviously there's a lot of proprietary chains in China, which is why they, they did it the BSN. So now with Hong Kong just, as a matter of fact, today is the actual launch uh, by a company called uh, DGX Note. So they somehow, I think they got a license or something that operate the, the international note for BSN in Hong Kong, collaboration with uh, Red Dates. So can, can you share a little bit about observations and what are the opportunities for international blockchain players? Yeah, look, absolutely. I, I think um, uh, as as Lucy touched on, the, the space evolves at the speed of light. Um, uh, I think, one one of the things that's really really starting to um, uh, zero in as a major area of opportunity is the interoperability and the interaction between different um, different blockchains, whether it be public or private, and also the intersection um, between the operations of different chains and different regulatory regimes, similar to what Matt touched on before. Um, uh, different countries, different regions are going to have different rules under which um, uh, systems can operate. Uh, the BSN is a is a great example of a um, uh, an initiative that's come out of China that um, is designed principally with the developer in mind. Um, so the key focus of the BSN is to reduce the cost of developing distributed systems um, for uh, for users across China and also internationally, and also to provide a gateway uh, through which to access a variety of different underlying technologies. Um, our particular part in that, uh, we've got a smart contract language demo uh, and a protocol that allows for cross-chain transactions. Um, we're only one of many that uh, are seeking to solve this kind of problem. But I think if you zoom out a little bit, um, Hong Kong is at the heart of solving the problem of there's not going to be one chain to rule them all. There's going to be many. And if assets are existing on many diverse different chains or workflows, are existing on many different chains. How do you get them all to stitch together? How do you start to compose these applications so that they work together and build on each other um, in a positive kind of way? So that um, I think the BSN is, is one initiative, uh, an important initiative that could be going some way to solving that problem. Um, more generally, though, I, I think um, the, uh, the existence of the BSN speaks to the core um, the core issue that we're, we're starting to see is different, um, uh, different regulated firms start to adopt 
uh, blockchain smart contract technologies, which is the notion of ecosystems. And um, uh, today, different different businesses control and maintain their own ecosystem of their suppliers and their customers. Um, and it's important that they have seamless interfaces with uh, uh, with those businesses as they as they operate each day. And my ecosystem is a little bit different to Matt's, is a little bit different to Lucy's, but we need to have a sort of handover points between us in order that we able to uh, we're able to do business together. This is particularly true in the capital market space when you look at um, major market operators like Hong Kong Exchange uh, that speaks to sub custodians, that speaks to global custodians, that speak to asset managers. Uh, there's a flow of information that needs to go backwards and forwards for the capital markets to operate uh, effectively. But there's also a need to maintain privacy and security um, across each of these different ecosystems as data transfers. And there's immense opportunity in solving those kinds of business problems facing uh, regulated uh, capital markets firms in, um, in automating the end-to-end -end, uh, processes. The last thing that I'd say is that tokenization, as, um, as Lucy touched on at the beginning, has many different meanings to, many, uh, to different people. I think um, what Hong Kong is at the forefront of doing is really leading the vanguard as to the level of sophistication of what, what does a token actually mean? What, what does it mean when we tokenize an asset? A lot of the, um, the early conversations about tokenization really focused on slicing something up into tiny little pieces and distributing it in order to enhance liquidity. But when you look at regulated capital markets, the, um, the majority of assets across Asia Pacific at least have been digital for 20 odd years. The real, the real area where tokenization can add some massive value is in thinking about how do assets perform throughout their life cycle. So whether you're talking about uh, a piece of real estate that has a rental income stream and a tax liability uh, and land rates liability attached to it, you've effectively got a series of cash flows and a series of involved parties so that if you're going to tokenize that thing, you've got to model all of that in. And that's also true whether you're modeling an equity, a derivative, a fixed income instrument or something else entirely. And so what Hong Kong is doing and a number of institutions throughout Hong Kong are really looking at whether we're talking about an insurance policy, uh, a, a trade finance type agreement or um, a, a structured product, um, tokenization is starting to be applied to solve some of the most fundamental problems in capital markets, which aren't just about registries and who owns what, but also how these assets behave and perform throughout their life cycle. So there's uh, a bunch of interesting stuff that's going on um, and probably starting from the BSN, going through tokenization, those are the things that are worth uh, touching on. <clears throat> that's great, John. Uh, we appreciate it. Now, I guess I will have uh, one last question for Matt. Now, I'll <laughs> open up to our uh, guests uh, from UK to uh, share your questions, uh, post it uh, to our experts. So hopefully we can uh, help give you like a better perspective on questions you have in mind. Now, I guess uh, the question I have for Matt is that uh, now you guys, uh, I saw this uh, press release that uh, OSL had this uh, JV so partnership with uh, Senate Charter in UK. So again, at the end of the day, what we like to do is to be a hub to work with uh, the other international partners like the UK. So you guys are really our ambassador uh, in doing so. So can you talk a little bit about that partnership? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, happy to. Um, so we we have um, we have a number of. I mean, we're a technology company, and we have a, we have a number of different business lines. Um, you know, we have four business lines, three of which we we deal with customers directly who utilize our, our technology stack with uh, within digital assets. Um, our fourth business line is is then a software as a service business. So we actually um, we actually take the, the the digital asset tax tech stack and sort of IP and processes from the other businesses. And then we go and we work with partners. Um, so we actually, uh, you know, we're not only standard chartered, but we provide the, the digital asset uh, exchange infrastructure for DBS Bank uh, in Singapore as well. Um, and so really the, the I guess the, the key value proposition that we have is, you know, for as, as larger regulated banks, um, regulated wealth managers, are increasingly coming into the space. Um, 
you know, for, for anyone that has worked in a sort of a, a larger regulated uh, entity like that, you know, they'll be very aware of the, the pace of technology change, uh, the, the, the incredible amount of tech debt, the, um, the inertia that exists. And so for those, for those types of organisations to be able to evolve and to meet the client need for, you know, to be able to invest into digital assets, you know, they turn to partners sort of like, like us. So they can actually, you know, they can move rapidly. Um, they can deliver a product at, uh, you know, at relatively low cost. Um, that's, you know, kind of the, the, I guess, the general framework. The, um, the other, I guess the other, and this is sort of tying back into the, into the previous question regarding security tokens as well, is um, the, the way that we've built our technology is that it is, um, it's asset class agnostic. So on our, you know, for an, on our exchange, for example, um, we can make uh, cryptocurrencies available, which we do, um, but we can also make security tokens available. And so the technology is agnostic in that a, um, you can trade a, a multiple range of digital assets on that. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's a pretty, again, if we look to where we think, you know, if we skate to where the puck is going, you know, we think that that therefore provides a, uh, a platform where multiple types of digital assets can all be traded on, on the one sort of infrastructure. Um, of note, we, and again, this is back to the, to the regulation question, the way that the, uh, the Securities and Futures Commission has, um, has built the regulation in Hong Kong, um, you know, we actually can offer security tokens have actually already traded security tokens under our license uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and, you know, we see, uh, again, um, you know, we, we're starting to see some very, very interesting use cases from issuers who are looking at, you know, the opportunities to, um, to use tokenization for various types of, you know, cash flows is a great word that John used, you know, it's assets, sure, but cash flows, um, different types of business opportunities. And that's, you know, we see over the next one, two, three, four years, that's, you know, has a real opportunity to, um, to to accelerate in that part of the you know that newly formed part of the uh, of the capital market. Great, <laughs> thank you, Matt, uh, uh, John, and Lucy for really setting the stage. So hopefully, the discussion just now uh, gave the uh, audience uh, a bit more context, uh, so that uh, hopefully can stimulate some questions. I saw um, a number of uh, guests here, like Diana, Mark, Looney. Laura, Alexi. So, I mean, I'm just curious. So you guys have any, any questions for our um, panelists so that I guess we can be more helpful to help you understand the opportunities here in Asia and Hong Kong. So any, any questions, I'll feel free to bring up. Uh, this is where, uh, this is what we're here for. Hi, King. Hi, everyone. I got a question if that's all right. Yep. yep, yep. Yes, please, please go ahead. It's uh, Alexi speaking, just uh, in case you were wondering. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah. so you guys are in Hong Kong and um, I guess the main question is um, you are right next to China. So you probably have a pretty good outlook on what the regulator there is uh, thinking in terms of the digital yuan, because as you know, that recent you know cryptocurrency correction was largely due to the situation with the Chinese regulator kind of discrediting the cryptocurrencies in general. And so um, what is your take on the, the situation there in terms of um, introduction of the digital yuan and how that's going to affect kind of the cryptocurrency markets? Because ultimately, the cryptocurrency markets are largely dependent on the regulator. And if they decide to outlaw it tomorrow, you know, or decide to tax it in a way that becomes, uh, let's put it that way, uh, unfriendly for um, doing business, the situation can change very quickly and very drastically. And uh, I mean, specifically with Bitcoin, you know, as it's coming towards the end of its uh, mining capacity, so to say, there's a lot of people that kind of speculate in terms of things can go sour very quickly. And uh, just wondering, what's your take on it? Do you want me sure. to go first? Um, that? Sure. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. So, look, I think a, a couple of a, a couple of data points, um, a couple of couple of proof points for, for discussion. I think so. Um, uh, and, and first one's probably a, just a 
almost a point of order. So I think um, so. Hong Kong is Hong Kong's not only near China; Hong Kong's part of China, and so the the entire regulatory framework here and oversight is now enmeshed uh, within sort of a, a, a one country, two systems dynamic, which is you know very very closely integrated now uh, into into the uh, into the mainland. So I think that's sort of the first point, but it's important to to make that point because it it, it sort of follows through to the to the rest of the to the, to the rest of the points. Um, the regulator in Hong Kong um, has been unequivocal uh, around their current and future treatment of digital assets or virtual assets as they as they turn them. Um, and currently, it is a, an opt-in regime uh, for the regulation of digital assets, but at some time, we think it will probably be during next year at some point, um, the, the head of the Securities and Futures Commission has confirmed it will move to a mandatory, mandatory licensing regime, um, which again, we, we think is, is, that's just very positive and it's very, um, uh, it's very indicative of the way that regulators here um, uh, undertake sort of signaling to the market on, on the way things are going to happen and the way that markets should evolve. So, you know, our view is you, you, we wind up with a regulated virtual asset cryptocurrency market um, uh, in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, and that's sort of quite clear. Um, with respect to the digital renminbi, um, I think most people who are close to it would say that it, uh, it, it is almost a certainty, uh, unequivocally within the next, pick a number, I don't know, five years, five to 10 years. I mean, it's... Uh, the amount that, you know, it, day by day, week by week, the trials that are being done across different um, communities within the mainland is, uh, are increasing in size and the, um, it is being proven as a, uh, as a technology that it, that it, that it works. Um, and I guess you, to, to your final point or question then, you know, we, we, we just see that as a huge positive for, for cryptocurrency markets. Um, we think it's completely complementary. We think that it, it um, the way that regulators are already providing a framework around public blockchains, um, it, it looks like they're really setting up for the, hopefully the um, harmonious sort of coexistence of, of uh, CBDCs and, and public blockchains. But I'm talking my own book, so um, you know, open to open for discussion. <laughs> <coughs> well, actually, can, can I invite the Lucy to share thoughts? Because we recently had a conversation about the role of CBDC versus stable coins. And so can you share your yeah. views? Um, no, I, I do agree to, to, to the extent that I think all regulators around the world are gonna move to regulating digital assets. And that includes decentralized cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. I think that's the general direction of travel. My concern with their latest um, regulatory framework that was proposed at the end of last year is that um, exchanges, virtual asset exchanges that don't trade security tokens, so they're not touching securities, um, are likely not going to be able to service retail in Hong Kong. So it's an investor protection move. You know, they want to, they say that crypto is very volatile and it's not really suitable for retail, but that there will be a step plan to get to retail, but starting with, you know, getting all the custody, the security, the hacks all sorted with professional investors. My worry in the short term is that the standards that you have to adhere to in order to be um, you know, able to even apply for the license puts you in the same category as very developed securities companies and financial institutions, essentially. You, know, you have to have very expensive insurance, you have to have custody, you have to have all the trappings of traditional financial securities firms. And if you are a startup, because this space is only just getting going, that can be quite a burden. You know, you need to raise a lot of capital and have a very strong team to even get into the game. Unless you're already established in another jurisdiction and you're looking to set up in Hong Kong. But I think, you know, for Matt, it's great because I see it as barriers to entry for, for BC Group. But, but listen, BC Group were there right at the beginning. You know, they, they've earned this, this position. Um, but that that's my worry. So I'm, I'm okay with where we're headed. I just worry for startups. Um, in the short term, uh, and they just need to be aware of, of that. Maybe um, maybe to build on both of those points, um, uh, 
the the other way to look at this is to view it as an opportunity in how the digital yuan is going to be used. Um, Matt talked about some of the experiments that are going on. Uh, it's only in the last week or so, I think, that uh, one of the experiments has been the settlement of the futures transaction of the Dalian Commodities Exchange, uh, which is one of, I think there's four big commodities exchanges in China, but um, stock exchanges and futures exchanges all over the world have got a DVP problem. Um, and uh, uh, the choice of how you actually settle trading activity um, when uh, cash and assets live on different ledgers has, has been a, a considerable area of um, uh, discussion and concern. The Bank for International Settlements has got a number of different settlement models that uh, uh, it proposes, and it depends on whether you're using central bank money or you're using money held in trust accounts, and every, every exchange has got a slightly different model. I think... Um, uh, from the perspective of a startup, looking at the, the digital yuan, um, I'd be thinking about what are the sort of workflows that you can do with it now that the currency itself is living on ledger and can be, can be moved around in this kind of way. Um, settling futures transactions is one example. Settling trade finance transactions is another. Posted collateral, there, there's all sorts of interesting things that you can do with it. Uh, I don't think it necessarily needs to be a contest between a whole bunch of different currencies. It's just, well, from a startup perspective, the areas of opportunity could be uh, to look at the things that you build with it now that you accept that it's going to be part of the landscape. <laughs> well, uh, I just want to add uh, one last point, and then I guess I'll, we can open up uh, for questions by the other uh, guests as well. Now, since we work very closely with the regulators, including SOC, the HMA, uh, you know, all, obviously we have been sort of chasing them about the latest status. Now, I think for, for those of you who have been following the news of the various pilots between the, the mainland regulators, you know, the Ban of Thailand, right, I mean, the UAE. So basically that the, the wholesale level CBDC have been uh, you know, under several different test runs. So that is not a, a, a big, big issue. I mean, that, I mean, I would say technically, they are we quite, quite ready. I think the, the, the bigger question that a lot of folks are kind of like uh, wondering is uh, the retail use cases of uh, CBDC. So uh, in fact, I, I met with the um, uh, senior leader at HMA within the past two or three weeks. So uh, as a follow-up to the developments of CBDC, you know, even for the big boys, right, at the regulator, they're still kind of like scratching their head. So what is that motivation? You know, let, let's just say that we have this, you know, the, the digital yuan that can be, you know, fully converted with the Hong Kong dollar. And let's just say there's a digital Hong Kong dollar, but what's the use case, right, for the Hong Kong people to adopt like a, you know, central, you know, current, uh, digital currency uh, when a lot of the mobile payments are just so convenient. So this is still something that you know, I think the, the senior leaders are still trying to get uh, their hands around it. Now, um, so I think the short answer is, uh, this is still work in progress. And uh, in terms of the M MCBDC, the multiple CBDC bridge, uh, uh, now the, being worked on by the BIS. Uh, the last time I checked with our good friend, uh, Benedict uh, Nolans, uh, there'll be a pretty uh, good announcement at the FinTech week in November about that progress. So I guess uh, all I can say at this moment is uh, stay tuned. <laughs> so until November. Now, um, so I guess uh, I, we still have a bit of time. Um, I just want to see if we can uh, get other guests to sort of uh, ask the questions. Again, we just trying to be helpful to you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, if not, perhaps uh, we can uh, perhaps share more information. So in, in that case, I'll probably go, go back to Lucy again. Now, so now when, when, I think that I saw this uh, project that you just um, co-invested, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, with uh, was it Fairchild or? Oh no, Rothschild. Was the Rothschild, Rothschild, right. Um, yeah. so, so can you talk a little bit about uh, that project that you just invested in? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so the company is called Aspen Digital and um, they're really looking to so that, you know, as we've been discussing the digital assets universe, investment universe is just proliferating at a really rapid rate. And we're increasingly beginning to see family offices, you know, ultra high net worths want to engage. They sort of say to their CFO, you know, go and invest in the, in the in crypto. And, you know, people look blankly. They're very nervous. It's an educational journey. You know, people still, I think, think of crypto back in the hacking days and, you know, losing your private keys. So um, Aspen Digital really wants to capture this new wave of asset managers, financial institutions, the smaller size and family offices moving into the space to create a one single gateway that you can access different um, digital asset products. You can um, you know, monitor your portfolio. You can access different custodians, different exchanges, get best execution across the board and really sort of handhold um, these kind of groups of, of you know, finance professionals as they get started on their digital asset journey. So the reason why I specifically chose Aspen Digital is the founders have already founded a crypto exchange and they founded a crypto media company. So there's already nice synergies, you know, proof that um, they execute, which is everything with startups. Um, and they've also got the network of all these big families and family offices and um, financial advisors to, to have the distribution network for this kind of product and really work um, hand in hand with them. So, you know, I'm, I'm very bullish on, on everyone starting to get to grips with these, uh, these new products, be they NFT, security tokens, DeFi tokens, you know, tokenized real estate, it's all going to come together. Um, so, so this is a startup that's really um, helping with the UX and, uh, and is an aggregator in a way like, like BSN. Great. Uh, now, uh, any other questions from our guests? If not, then I'll pose another question for our three speakers. Uh, any questions so far? We've been very informative, King. <laughs> yeah, well, I know this is a lot of information bombarding our guests. Um, so any burning question? If not, then I'll, I'll fire off another question for our three speakers. Well, I, now, can, um, follow, I can follow up for what Lucy okay. just said. Sure. Uh, it's, it's very interesting that, um, you know, some of the bigger kind of B2B custodian platforms, like you said, you're just kind of investing into similar kind of project is that one of the biggest ones that I've come across is Fireblocks. And uh, just to kind of get a grip on how viral the sector is going, I, I mean, Fireblocks right now supports only 524 tokens. And, uh, you know, this space has just over the last couple of years exploded so much that like even the industry leaders that just absolutely cannot keep up with the amount of tokens that are going out there, which goes to show that it's definitely a viral space. It's also, I suppose, to to um, to your point, it's a it's a it's a space that's evolving very rapidly. I think five blocks may be four or five years old. Uh, it's sort of. Uh, but but it's obviously not just Fireblocks. At uh, OSL and their custody offering, I know there's another business down in Singapore, uh, on-chain custodian. I, I think there is a real understanding of the need for institutional grade custody of these new classes of assets, and as you say, to to be able to support um, to support them all in the one place. Uh, I think asset managers expect to be able to handle traditional assets and digital assets using a seamless platform. And I think there's a number of players that are, uh, uh, are heading in that direction. I, I mean, Matt, probably good to get your, um, your take on the evolution of uh, custody. Sorry, jump off mute. Yeah, it's, um, it is evolving. It's evolving really, really quickly. Um, you know, Fireblocks have got a great product. Um, you know, we, uh, we know them and work with them. Um, and you know, I think the the, the custody, the digital asset custody industry as a whole is is on the road to sort of solving that problem of being being able to behave like a a traditional a traditional custodian a traditional prime. Um, it's sort of it's not there yet, but it's uh, you know because of the because the market microstructure is different. And I think you know to the to the question, you know, so many tokens, so many new tokens, so many you know. 
different protocols um, that that you know obviously poses a uh, a significant challenge for uh, you know for institutional grade custodians to be able to sort of continue continue adding. But it's um, clear, clearly the build you know it continues it uh, and, and it's evolving in the right way. Great. Um, well, perhaps uh, I can uh, have another question for our uh, three speakers on fundraising. So um, again, I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of overseas players that they would like to perhaps look for strategic investors uh, in Hong Kong or in Asia. So what would be the kind of advice that you can give them? Uh, I'll look, I'm, I can, I'll jump off first quickly, if you like, as a, as a, as a listed yeah. company. I mean, um, you know, the, uh, the the Hong Kong exchange, you know, uh, I mean, you sort of, you can do the marketing probably uh, probably better than I can, King, but I think, you know, it's biggest IPO market in the world, one of the deepest liquidity, one of the biggest derivatives markets, um, you know, stock connect, north and south bound, um, some very big indices, um, gateway to China. I mean, it sort of sort of ticks a whole lot of a whole lot of boxes. Um, and then you have with that a, I, I guess the the overlay of a very very vibrant tech sector. So, you know, for us, it's um, it's it's an obvious place to be listed. Um, uh, we've we've done we've done a couple of rounds in the last eighteen months, um, and uh, have had uh, you know have had the fortune of adding, you know, invest, you know, large institutional investors, you know, like, um, like Fidelity, um, like GRC, uh, you know, onto our cap stack um, as, uh, as part of those fundraisings, um, you know, being, being listed in Hong Kong just sort of clearly provides a, uh, uh, as, as you mentioned to start with, every, every wirehouse is here, every bank is here, every, you know, it's, it's just an obvious place to be listed for us. Uh, from, from from our side, um, we've been fortunate to raise across uh, four rounds now about three hundred million dollars um, uh, uh, from a range of uh, investors, both strategic investors within the financial um, uh, financial services industry. So four of the biggest stock exchanges in the world have invested in us. Uh, a whole bunch of investment banks, custodians, um, but more recently, we've also had investment from private equity type firms. Um, I think probably the the fundamental thing that I'd say for for people that are operating in the um, uh, in the digital assets or the blockchain space, whichever public or permissioned or somewhere in between uh, that, that your service sits, um, is to really focus on the business problem that you're solving and the, the scale of the business opportunity. I, I think one of the things that's uh, wonderful about the digital assets and the blockchain space is that so much technology is open source. Um, but that does mean that the barrier to entry for somebody to say, I've got a blockchain, is, is actually pretty low. Um, and so one of the ways that you can stand out, particularly here in Asia, um, I, I don't have a global perspective. I've, uh, I've been here, stuck here, thanks to COVID. Um, but um, I think from a, from a business perspective, you can illustrate how the unique capacities of your technology or your service are able to do things that couldn't be done before and why that's part of this larger macro trend that Mac, uh, Matt and Lucy have talked about. Uh, these are the things that investors in Asia are very responsive to. Um, we've been fortunate to have a number of uh, major firms across the Asia Pacific that have uh, put money into digital asset. And I think part of it, yes, is because of our technology. Um, but a big part of it, I think, is that we're very applied and very focused in the sorts of problems that we solve. So. Um, to the extent that you're on that same sort of fundraising journey, uh, I'd, I'd recommend focus and I'd recommend business solutions. Yep. Uh, any closing thought, uh, Luke, Lucy, from a fundraising tips perspective? Okay, you do a mute. I'm operating at a slightly different level. You know, I'm not I'm not raising 200, 300 million quite yet. Although I have set myself up to be institutional grade. So, you know, watch this space. Um, but, you know, I'm an early stage venture fund. So it's, it's you know, getting in early. It's, it's what are the ideas? It's, it's connecting the dots because I, you know, have an extensive network in the space and, and spotting the trends. Um, 
listen, it kind of goes back to my opening comment. If you if you are very early stage and you haven't already developed your company overseas and you're, you know, because it, it could be Hong Kong as your Asia expansion, but coming to Hong Kong with a new idea, I mean, it, it's, it's a great networking city um, for every level, but definitely for startups, I would say as well. There's a lot of appetite for um, great ideas and people that can execute. Okay, <laughs> thanks so much. I guess perhaps... A uh, uh, final thoughts uh, on this note for me is that I, I had this uh, meeting uh, recently with the president of the uh, Hong Kong Venture Capital and Private Equity Association. And we're just talking about the AUM managed by the members of the HKVCA. So basically they have a, a couple hundred members and collectively they manage uh, over uh, 2 trillion US dollars. So they, all these people, they live in Hong Kong. Two trillion US. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. So that's like what 12 zeros, right? <laughs> so anyway, I think the I think this is a good way to perhaps uh, wrap up this training session today. So hopefully we can be helpful to you, uh, be informative. And at the same time, I just want to have my most uh, sincere gratitude to our three speakers. You know, always you, know, you guys are always there for us. We really thank you, like Lucy, uh, John, and Matt. You guys have been awesome. And, uh, and again, I hope that uh, we are able to connect uh, some of these uh, folks to you and uh, perhaps some new businesses uh, can take place upwards. So with that, I just want to wish you uh, all a great day. And uh, so thanks so much for joining us today. Great, thank you, King. Thanks, thanks right. so much. Thanks okay. everyone. Yep. Thanks. All right, take care. Thank you.